You need 28 miles pipe work. But mate. we're only heating and airing cupboards. 28 mil pipe work. What about the rest of the house? 28 mil pipe work. Okay, what about our 15,000 square foot offices? 28 mil pipe work. What about... 28 mil pipe work. This issue really gets my goat. Somewhere it's been picked up that all heat pump installations always need 28 mil pipe work and that all microboard doesn't work. Well, once again, there is no panacea and every job is a case by case basis. And we're here once again to explain all the variables that you need to know to figure out if you need your pipe work upgraded or not in order to have a heat pump. This will be supplementary to a step-by-step -step article over on heatgeek.com with full cheat sheets for anyone wanting to fully digest this information and work out exactly if they need their pipe work upgraded or not. And we'll link to that down in the comments below. The most common myth you'll hear is that all low temperature heating systems need large bore pipe work. And that's completely incorrect. A 10 kilowatt high temperature heat pump, say at 70 degrees, will need 30 liters a minute circulating, which funnily enough, you will actually need 28 mil pipe work for. A 10 kilowatt low temperature heating system, say 30 degrees, also needs 30 liters per minute which needs 28 mil pipe work. So the temperature of the system doesn't actually make any difference at all. The main variable is how much flow rate you need, and that's dictated by how much power is required to be moved. Double the heating load to say 20 kilowatts required, and you'll need double the flow rate. A much bigger bore pipe work, probably 42 millimeter. Or half the load to say five kilowatts, and you'll half the flow rate, and 22 millimeter pipe work will be just fine. To work out exactly how much power you need in your home or even one specific room, grab our cheat sheet over on heatgeek.com. We'll post it here uh, in the video and we'll put a link below and simply multiply the room that you're heating or whole building you're heating in meters squared by the relevant watts per square meter. Remember you can watch a video to see exactly how to do this, how to size my heat pump, post that up there. And again, I'll drop a link in the description below. So that's the system load and how much flow rates required. The one other variable there is, is the system DT. The system DT is the temperature difference between the flow and the return, or the temperature drop between the flow and return. DT standing for differential temperature or delta T, delta temperature. Now heat pumps want to run at a temperature differential or a temperature difference or temperature drop of between five and seven degrees. Five degrees being a more ideal temperature drop. So the heat pump will raise its return water by five degrees. Or you could say that the radiators drop the flow temperature by five degrees. They both mean the same thing. Now to give an idea of perspective, gas boilers have a temperature drop or differential temperature of 20 degrees. So their flow temperature is 20 degrees above their return, or their return is 20 degrees below their flow temperature. As the slower the flow rate, the wider the temperature drop, this means that gas boilers are four times slower flow rate than a heat pump. And that's why heat pumps need bigger pipe work, generally speaking. So once we know the amount of power we need to get to a certain area or in the whole house, and we know the system DT or the temperature drop we want between the flow and the return, we can use our mass flow rate triangle, which looks like this. There's a video how to use that up there as well. Or you can use our cheat sheet, which I'm going to post down below. Simple, just like the decision to subscribe to this channel. So now knowing that heat pumps have a much narrower temperature drop between the flow and return, four times narrower, and that that means you need four times faster the flow rate, you'll be forgiven for thinking that you need four times larger bore pipe work. But in actual fact, there's a few things here that mean most of the time, the majority of your pipe work is absolutely fine how it is. The first reason is that older pipe work, say pre-2005, was all designed for DT11. All older boilers worked at DT11, which means that their flow rate was twice as fast as current boilers, and so have slightly larger pipe work for that exact reason. Reason two, insulation has improved greatly since they were installed. Most heating systems in the UK were installed between 1920 and the 1970s. These properties have all had huge upgrades since then to their insulation. And even since 2005, insulation's improved. Double glazing's been installed, loft insulation's been installed, which reduces the load required from the heating system and means their pipework can be much smaller now. In fact, I'd say most properties have halved their heat loss, which means their pipework is two times larger than it needs to be. Reason three, historically, most installers installed on rules of thumb rather than actually calculating. And the rules of thumb were from these olden days where we used DT11 and had higher heat losses. Reason four, 
A small increase in pipe diameter gives a much larger increase in volume. In fact, if you double the diameter of pipe, you increase its volume by eight. This gives a lot of wiggle room for existing pipework. Now, bearing all of that in mind, let's see if you need to upgrade your pipework. Take a look at our cheat sheet here. You can grab this cheat sheet from the link in the description. Here you have the external pipe diameter on the left-hand column and how many kilowatts of power the pipe can carry in the middle. Now, in theory, you can carry any amount of kilowatts of power through a pipe. It's just that the friction or speed at which the water moves against the edge of the pipe increases, and that can give some pretty major issues. First of all, as this speed of the water moving against the edge of the pipe increases, you get erosion corrosion. This is where the wall of the pipe is eroded away by the friction of the water, releasing the metals into the water, making the water corrosive, and also, in extreme circumstances, actually wearing through the pipe itself. Secondly, you get more noise around your system, which obviously isn't something you want when you're running for longer periods. And lastly, but most importantly for heat pumps, as you increase this flow, your resistance to flow or the friction against the pipe exponentially increases, making it harder and harder to push that water around the pipework at a sensible flow rate. If the resistance is too high, you won't be able to get the flow rates and the system just won't work. So the speed at which this water moves through the pipework is called the water's velocity and it has typical limits of 0.5 meters per second to 1.5 meters per second as a maximum. Now what we typically aim for is 0.9 meters per second. After this point, the resistance to flow exponentially really jumps up and just makes the whole thing a lot more difficult to manage. And that's the other number you see in this top column here, 0.9 meters per second, which is the maximum velocity we've aimed for, along with the temperature drop. So let's say you've followed our cheat sheet and you've worked out that you need seven kilowatts of power in your property, and you have 22 millimeter primary pipework throughout your house. Primary pipework is just like the main pipework before it tees off to the radiators. Using this table, we can see that if we want to maintain a DT of five, temperature drop of five, Really, our maximum is about six kilowatts. In reality, seven kilowatts is probably okay. It's just that temperature drop might drop to around six or your velocity might go up to one, which is probably just fine again. Like I say, there's wiggle room here, but what's important to remember is there's no pipework that's too big. If your pipework can carry much more energy than you require, that's absolutely fine. And actually with heat pumps, the added volume is actually quite helpful for heat pumps for keeping up efficiencies and having higher scops. Now, if our system load was actually 12 kilowatts and we had 22 millimeter pipe work, you can see that we might have to run at a delta T of 10. Now, heat pumps aren't likely to work very well at a delta T of 10. They'll probably throw up faults. So there's a few options here. First of all, this only means really that the main run from the heat pump to your existing pipe work needs to be in 28 millimeter. We don't necessarily need to update any of the existing pipe work. Take this system, for example. This primary pipe work here and here is 22 millimeter. And we know we need 28 millimeter pipe work from the heat pump. But if we remove the existing boiler and tee into the system here, we can leave the existing pipe work as 22 millimeter. Because once the flow of water gets to that 22 millimeter pipe work, some flow of water will go up and some of the flow of water will go down, reducing the velocity. You can work out exactly how much water or energy is needs to go up and go down by measuring the floor surface area in those rooms and using our heat loss cheat sheet and then using our pipe size cheat sheet again. So in this case, absolutely none of the existing pipe work needs replacing at all. Perhaps only this bit of small communal pipe work if we were connecting our flow and return into the existing boiler flow and return. If we found out the load at the top of the building here was very, very low and a much higher load down the bottom, much more flow would be required down in the bottom half of this property. And this bit of pipework would need upgrading to 28, certainly to at least the first radiator or two. Unless you use the next option, which is hydraulic separation. Hydraulic separation comes in a few forms, such as close couple T, a buffer, a low loss header, or a plate heat exchanger. It provides what's called a hydraulic break. So the main heat source only has to pump to this break and then it returns back on itself. You then have a second pump that pumps from this hydraulic break around the rest of the system. So it's basically splitting up how much work the pump has to do and installing another pump. You can then have one flow rate on the system side, running at whatever flow rate you want within reason, and then have the flow rate on your heat source side run it exactly what the heat source wants to see, which is a temperature drop of five, as we know. As with all engineering though, this is a compromise. If we cater for the smaller pipework on the secondary side of this hydraulic break by running at slower flow rate and a wider temperature drop, we create what's called distortion. 
This essentially means that the heat pump has to run slightly hotter than it would do if they were running at the same flow rate both sides. And that in turn means the efficiency drops slightly. Or it could even stop the whole system working because the temperature required at the heat pump is above what the heat pump can produce. Of course, you can account for this by installing bigger radiators, but you should already be installing the biggest radiators you could possibly fit anyway. However, it's still another option. So adding something like a low loss header or a buffer is a compromise. If you're like me and you wanna geek out a lot more on that, we have a whole video on that called why not to use low loss headers. We'll link up to that up there so you can understand exactly why and what happens here. Now with all of this, bear in mind there are other criteria that we should be allowing for, uh, like pressure loss around the system. I'm just trying to keep this simple for you guys to understand as homeowners so you can get a rough guide of whether you need to upgrade or not. System volume shouldn't really be an issue in most scenarios and it should be catered for by using a correct control strategy. That'll be a video we do another time, but to give you a clue, you can watch our Why Not To Zone Heat Pumps video which again, we'll link to up there. The other reason you might install a buffer is to add system volume. However, we'd suggest instead using a system volumizer, which works slightly differently and negates any distortion. We'll do a video on that another time if you're interested. Actually, if you're interested, just pop a uh, comment in the comment section below and pop a comment about anything else you wanna learn about. Perhaps I'm steering this whole series down a path uh, that isn't answering your question. What questions have you got for me? Post them below. So that covers the primary pipe work. What about the radiator pipe work that comes off of the primary pipe work? Well, most radiators are fed from 15 millimeter pipe work, which is fine for up to three kilowatts of demand. And that's absolutely fine in most circumstances. If you have smaller bore pipe work than that, use our heat loss cheat sheet to find out the load in that area. Then use the pipe work cheat sheet to find out if your pipe can carry the amount of energy required. Now, if your pipe work feeding the radiators isn't ample, there is another solution. And this one's much better than upgrading your pipe work. Rather than spending your money on expensive pipe work upgrades, why not look at insulation? Increasing insulation around our properties, instead of improving or increasing pipework bore, does three additional things. It will effectively increase the relative pipework size in your property as you will have less energy you need to move around. So your previously undersized pipework all of a sudden becomes oversized because you have much less energy to deliver to each room. It will mean the radiators that you size will be able to run at a much lower temperature and increase your heat pump efficiency. And obviously, it will lower your overall heat demand, which lowers the amount of energy that you require anyway. Okay, that's it for the complicated bit. Just a few other caveats that I wanna point out before you go off into the big wide world and do this for yourself. First of all, these numbers are not for plastic pipe. Plastic pipe does not belong in heating systems, and particularly on a heat pump. I'll do a video another time, but there is loads of reasons. But if you are using plastic pipe or you have it already installed, you have to jump up to the next size. And the reason for that is the little inserts that you get in fittings just strangle and restrict the flow a little bit too much to make this rule of thumb work. And will also make balancing more difficult. The other thing to look out for is particularly long pipe runs. Let's say you had a building uh, that was extended. Uh, so you had a nice long heating circuit, normal size heating circuit. And then we built an extension on the side and you've teed off that to go to some faraway radiators. That's gonna probably need slightly larger pipe work uh, just because the energy's got further to go. Having said that, extensions are normally well insulated, so the relative pipe size will probably be quite large anyway. And the last caveat is that if you have glycol in your system, now glycol is sometimes used in heat pumps. Glycol is basically antifreeze. Obviously the heat pump generally is outside. Uh, we don't wanna freeze a pipe work. So if you have glycol, this actually lowers the specific heat capacity of the water. That means its ability to carry heat. Uh, therefore, you need more flow and slightly larger pipe sizes. For that reason, our cheat sheet, you'll see at the bottom there, we ask you to multiply the amount of power you can carry down that pipe by 0.9 to find out actually how much power you can carry if you add glycol in, which is around 90% of what you would have had. As with all engineering, it's a compromise. If you, however, decided that actually this is quite complicated and you don't really want to do this yourself, we're going to be offering a HeatGeek backed guarantee heat pump install. So what that will come with is a two year guarantee from HeatGeek 
that that system is going to work and perform as per the paperwork and the design which we run through with you. We use highly trained local heat geeks nationally. These have undergone training that is incomparable in the UK currently. It's the best training that's out there and widely recognised as so. Uh, so we find your local heat geek, if there's one in your area, we can't guarantee the, the whole nation just yet. Uh, we find your local one, he comes over, maybe you'll get a quote from another one. Um, he'll come back to Hikik HQ where Richard will help um, formulate a, a quotation for them. And uh, yeah, you'll get a Heat Geek backed heat pump guarantee. If you found this useful, drop us a like, make sure you subscribe uh, and any questions, as I say, post it down in the comments below and I'll see you in the next one. If you're a consumer and would like more advice on renewable heating, check out our consumer series playlist here on Heat Geek for all you need to know about renewable heating and energy.